we have been talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. And for those of you who have managed to keep up with it, we began with a series of six tapes, the first of which deals with the biblical understanding of the Trinity as a whole. The second tape dealt with the logic of the Trinity, how logical a doctrine the Trinity is in effect. The third tape dealt with the Father, specifically who is the Father, what he does, and how he operates in this life. The fourth tape dealt with the God-man from a theological perspective, and then the fifth tape dealt with the God-man from a practical perspective to what the God-man does for us and how we are brought in through the God-man to the life of the Father. Now, the, the sixth tape today is the final closing message on the Holy Spirit. And I have got an hour and 20 minutes to give all there is to give on the Holy Spirit, which quite obviously is an impossibility. So, I would like to pack these tapes for you so that if and when you procure them, you'll be able to sit down in your living room and simply play them back and literally, hopefully, prayerfully, if you wish to run a Bible study, spend hours and hours on some of the things that we'll be talking about today. And in order to do this, I have to move in a direction where I'd like to provide a biblical, solid foundation on the identity or the person of the Holy Spirit himself. In order to do that, I'm going to need to give you a lot of scripture. Now, I don't intend to look up all the scriptures with you. This is a waste of time. You can do this yourself. But today you're going to work. Today you're going to focus on the scriptures and you're going to take, if you will, your picks and your shovels and put on your work clothes and take some of this stuff down so that you can leave here and look this stuff up when you get home. Okay? So my first basic point is on the person of the Holy Spirit. From there we'll move to the presence of the Holy Spirit culminating in the power of the Holy Spirit. These three issues, these three facets of the Holy Spirit I wish to cover today and it will then go on this tape so you can have it for your records. Now I'd like all of you to pull out a piece of paper if you really want to work today because you know me, I'm not one to just flab her mouth off and then let you guys go out and say, well, what can we find in all that jargon that he said? I want to give you something today. Now, when we talk about the person of the Holy Spirit, this is, will be divided into three parts. The first point, the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm doing this so you can take kind of an outline down and follow with me. It'll take me about 20 minutes to get through the Scriptures. But once you've got it, you've got it. And then you can teach it. You can begin to really experience it as you look this stuff up. Within the context of the person of the Holy Spirit, I have three divisions. His definition, his description, and his disclosure. Okay? These are the three points we're going to move through with respect to the person of the Holy Spirit. Then, within that second part, the description of the Holy Spirit, I want you to take down these words so you follow me. We're going to deal with the quality of his being, the character of his being, the work of his being, and the identity of his being. Okay, that's in your center point. Now that you've got that, you just take the scriptures down corably under each of those headings and you'll have it. We pray. Right? Alright, now, the definition of the Holy Spirit. We said, when we talked Trinity, we said the Father is that manifestation of God that is so majestic, so great, so infinitely powerful that we, in and of ourselves, are unable to perceive him. He's too great for us to understand or perceive him. This is God in all of his fullness represented in the Father. When we talk about the God-man, we said that the God-man was that manifestation of God that reveals the Father to us. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten God 
Son in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. We cannot see the Father, but in Christ we can. We cannot grasp the Father, but in Christ we can. We cannot experience the Father, but in Christ we can. You see. Now, what good does it do if we see the Father, if you will, before us, in Christ's oneness with the Father, and yet cannot relate to that, cannot grasp to that. Christ was one with the Father. But what does that have to do with me? He was one with the Father, but I am not one with the Father. Indeed, just because I see someone that is one with the Father, how can I participate in the same oneness that he's experiencing? That's the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit brings the dynamic revelation of the Father in Christ to us so that we are able to then appropriate that life to ourselves. And so that is basically the definition in capital of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has been called the Holy Ghost, Spirit of Christ, Spirit of the Father, Spirit of Power. Or just the Spirit. And that's his definition. Now let's look at his description for a moment. And within the first category of the Holy Spirit's description, we want to talk about the quality of his being. What type of a quality does the Holy Spirit have? Well, he obviously has the same qualities that God has. Right? This is logical. First of which is he is omnipotent. Actually, we're going to go through the three omnis. You know what they are. But omnipotence is the first. That means there is no power on this earth or in the universe that is greater collectively than the Holy Spirit himself. No power. You see this in Job 26, 13. Job 33, 4. Psalm 33, 6. Psalm 104, 30. Secondly, he's omnipresent. Oh, this is beautiful. That means he's everywhere. You know, there's not a place you can go or a situation that you can find yourself or a person that you can meet that will be outside of the presence of the Holy Ghost. Now, if that doesn't tell you you're not alone, Ever, I don't know what will. Omnipresence, Psalm 139, 7 and 8. John 14, 17. Romans 8, 9. But he is also omniscient. That means that there's no particle of your being that is not already known. He knows it all. And that means there's no situation or problem that you can face that God does not already know about and understand. Now, if that doesn't bring comfort, I don't know what does. We spend hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of dollars every year just to try to convey to somebody what our problems are so they might understand. And yet the Holy Spirit already understands. Why? He's omniscient. 2 Corinthians 2.10 and others. These are just an outline. You can move into the scriptures and add to them. And then, of course, he is eternal. No beginning, no ending, was always, is always, will be always. Now, that means that no matter where we find ourselves in this intransient world, God stands forever. Hebrews 9, 14. That's the quality of his being. Now let's move into the character of his being. When we talk the quality, we still are somewhat distant with respect to the fact that our quality of being is not the same, identical, as the quality and being of God. Which means that there must be a relatedness that occurs between ourselves and God if we are to ever experience Him. 
Now, this is why it's necessary to demonstrate not only that the Holy Spirit is indeed and shares the same qualities of God himself, but that the Spirit himself is a person or a being. God is the being of God. Now, as a consequence, I'm going to run down a lot of attributes of the character of the Holy Spirit to which you can look up and demonstrate with respect to the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person. First, he teaches. He teaches. John 14, 26. An impersonal force cannot teach. An impersonal force, perhaps, could push. And sometimes we in the church attempt to push people into being taught. But in effect, that's the wrong motive, as we'll discuss a little later. The Holy Spirit teaches, not by pushing, but by evoking in you a response and desire to learn. Secondly, he comforts. I don't care where you're at right now. I don't care what you're feeling right now. I do care. But there's someone that cares even more, the Holy Spirit. Because he is participant in those feelings. Right now, where you sit, the Holy Spirit is there. And he wants to comfort you. Now, with respect to his teachers, I said John 14, 26. Again, the same verse bears to his comforting. John 14, 26. John 15, 26. John 16, 7. The book of John is great on the Holy Spirit, with particular chapters 14, 15, 16. Whenever you have a problem, read 14, 15, and 16 of John, and you're going to learn something about the Holy Ghost. Thirdly, he inspires. 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 1.21. Now, I might add that his inspiration is to allow us not only to receive from him, but also the Holy Ghost inspires us to give. Now, we talk about these two references with respect to the writers of the Scriptures, but we seem to forget that the writers of the Scriptures, while they did receive from God the power gave themselves to over to God that that power might be released so they might write. What is it then that we are inspired to do? We are inspired to engage in the giving and the receiving in relationship. Again, he appoints and he sends. Acts 13, 2 through 4. Let me tell you something. A lot of people here that might be having an identity crisis with respect to their vocation. Well, I don't care where you are right now. When you are open to the Holy Ghost and involved with Him as a person, then He will open the doors and send you through. And He will appoint you day by day to the area of life that you need to be engaged in in order to receive your own fulfillment. He speaks. Well, how can an impersonal power speak? Acts 13.2. Now, I just want to stop here for a moment and simply say that a lot of people would perhaps speak of the idea of the Holy Spirit as an impersonal power. And in this context, when you bring up Acts 13.2, see, the Holy Spirit speaks, they will say to you, well, what that really means is that the Holy Spirit speaks uh, that really is saying God is speaking, but the Holy Spirit is still an impersonal force. What's your question? Now, why did you say that? That's your question. Well, it's a metaphor. Oh, is it? Why do you say it's a metaphor that the Holy Spirit speaks? There must be a reason for that. What would indicate in that passage a metaphor? Well, there are a lot of metaphors in the Bible. Oh, yes, they are. And if I stand before you, as Jesus Christ say, the God-man, and I say to you, I am the vine. You might perhaps perceive me, a flesh and blood being, standing before you, just like yourself, speaking to you. And if I say, I am a vine, do I look like a vegetable to you? No. So obviously, I'm going a little deeper in my descriptiveness when I say I am the vine. I am using a metaphor. There's a reason for me to assume that a metaphor is being used. What? I am a man and I'm saying I am a vine. There's a contradiction. Either that or I'm crazy. But 
When you have Acts 13, 2 saying the Holy Spirit speaks, there is no reason in these passages that indicate a character within the being of the Holy Spirit himself. No reason for us to assume that what is being said there is a metaphor, unless you have a presupposition in your theology that says the Holy Spirit is not a person. That means every place where the Holy Spirit is shown forth to have a character must be reinterpreted as metaphor on the basis of the presupposition the Holy Spirit is not a person. With respect, of course, to the Watchtower, that's their theology. The Holy Spirit is not a person. Therefore, all passages that gear into the fact that the Holy Spirit has a character are reinterpreted. But there's no reason for that other than that presupposition. So you say to your man who says that's really God, but when the Holy Spirit is, see, what they mean there is that God is speaking, you say, why do you say that? There's no possible reason for them to say that. But again, an impersonal force can't speak. He can be tempted. Acts 5, 9. How do you tempt an impersonal force? Same argument that I just gave uses, is, can be used all the way through this. He can be lied to. Acts 5, 3. How do you lie to an impersonal force? He can be grieved. Oh, that's a good one. How do you grieve the wind? Ephesians 4.30 He can be resisted Now granted you can resist the power But in context with everything else that we've said The character of the Holy Spirit is obviously one of power also So we can't just skip it Acts 7.51 He can be insulted How do you insult a lightning bolt? Hebrews 10.29 he can be blasphemed. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. Now, I, I, that really interests me. That character, that, that characteristic of the Holy Ghost really interests me. It always amazes me as to how a person, a flesh and blood person, the very substance of God's flesh, the God-man, cannot be blasphemed. But, the Holy Spirit, who is proclaimed not to be a being, can be. I don't understand that. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe you can explain it. See, that's your approach. Maybe you can help me out. I'm the yo-yo. You're the smart one. Help me understand that question, if you will. See what they say. Kick back and relax. The burden of proof is on them. Okay? He prays hard for a power, just an impersonal power to actually pray, Romans 8, 26. Okay, that then is the character. Now let's move on to the work of his being. Now hang in there. We're going through the world. There's geez, all this scripture you're saying. Listen, you've got to have a foundation for what you say, right? Well, when are you going to talk to us? I'll talk to you. Just give me a moment. I want to get the verses down. Okay? The work of his being. He searches. He searches. 1 Corinthians 2.10. That means there is a movement, if you will, of the Holy Ghost through your being as you participate in the life that he brings. He testifies. John 15.26. That means that everything there is to know about God that needs to be related to the situation in which you find yourself right here and now, the Holy Ghost comes and moves in you to bring the need an answer. And he searches out your need if you let him. So don't try to hide from him whatever your need might be. I mean, don't push it off into the corner and forget about it. It's there. Admit it and let the Holy Ghost search it out and bring to you an answer to that need. He reproves John 16, 8 through 11. That means that when we're moving in a direction that is somewhat less than the experience and fullness of life to which we were created to participate in, 
the Holy Spirit reproves us in the sense say, uh-uh, bad direction. Don't go this way. Try that one. Okay, that's what reproving means. He regenerates, John 3, 5. That means that while you yourself do not have the power to perceive the things of God, the Holy Spirit has the power and brings that power into your body, into your vessel, that you yourself might begin to experience the data of spiritual things. That's regeneration, okay? He dies. John 16, 13. This means, again, that none of us are at loss. None of us are on a boat floating around in a sea somewhere without direction. But there's a guidance day by day by the Holy Spirit as we begin to participate in his life. He's the author of the new birth. It is only by the Holy Spirit that the work and person of Jesus Christ can be appropriated to our beings. John 3, 5 and 6. He does miracles. Oh, I don't think there's anybody here who doesn't know that. Matthew 12, 28. Luke 11, 20. And Acts 19, 11. And then he raises the dead. Oh, yeah. Romans 8, 11. That's power. <laughs> That's quite a bit of power. I don't care who your worst enemy is. And how much you disagree with him. If you found out that he died three days ago, and then somebody came into the class and said, Oh, by the way, and whispered in your ear, you know that guy that died three years or three three days ago? Yeah, he was just raised up. You might perhaps begin to question whether or not you should be in disagreement with this person. I mean, maybe he just might have something to offer. <laughs> Okay, the work of his being. Finally, the identity of his being as God. Now, first, Isaiah 6, 8 through 10, cross into Acts 28, 25 through 27. And then your second demonstration of who the Holy Spirit is, being God, is Exodus 16, 7, cross to Psalms 95, 8 through 11, cross to Hebrews 3, 7 through 11. Now, what these two arguments, if you will, or statements indicate is that in the Old Testament, God, Jehovah, is speaking to his people. He's identified as God, Jehovah, doing the speaking. When put into the New Testament context, Paul and the writer to the Hebrews attribute the very words that God used in the Old Testament to the Holy Spirit. So... The Holy Spirit is said to have said it in the New Testament, and Jehovah God is said to have said it in the Old Testament. What possible conclusion might you draw? Yeah, the Holy Spirit is God. And you say, well, uh, that's uh, again just saying that the Holy Spirit said it in the New Testament means that God said it. But the Holy Spirit is still an impersonal force, to which you say, why do you say that? Right. You've got... <laughs> You've got to turn the vortex of argumentation over to the person that says it. Don't always feel you've got to answer everybody. Ask a question. Let him suffer a while and sweat <laughs> to bring some answers. You know? I mean, believe me, people, there's only one Bible answer, man. <laughs> so don't try to duplicate it. Okay? Just you throw out some questions. Let them try to duplicate them. It's tough, believe me. I've tried. It's tough. You can't do it. And then, of course, Acts 5, 3 and 4 states quite specifically the Holy Spirit is God. And most specifically, I mean, you, you can't get a clearer phrase in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is that 
spirit. I mean, you know. Well, that means, uh, that means that, uh, Why do you say that? Oh. You just sit back. Relax. Enjoy yourself. Have a cup of coffee. All right. All right. Now we move, we move from the definition to the description to his disclosure. Now, what do I mean when I say his disclosure? I'm going to give you some questions to ask, okay? After you have proceeded to move through all of the references that I've just given, there are some conclusive questions that need to be asked of those that say the Holy Spirit is nothing but an impersonal force. Now, you take the questions down, and you get them in your mind, and basically they're real easy questions. It's just a matter of, of, of logic, just asking what seems to, to be a problem here based on what they are saying. First question, in Revelation, okay? His disclosure in Revelation. Here's the question. How can that, which is impersonal, fully reveal that which is personal. I, mean, I don't understand that. You are saying that there's an impersonal something called the Holy Spirit that has the job of expressly revealing He who is most intimate and personal. They say, well, it's kind of like a television set. Oh? Yeah. You see, the Holy Spirit is like a TV set. He or it is the set, but what it reveals is the personal being of God. Now what do I see? Hear people shaking in their boots. Oh, gee, how do you get out of that one? Well, I have a question for you. Is there anyone here that feels they have a personal relationship with the President of the United States revealed to you through the television set and the newspaper. Would you please stand to your feet? No. Nobody? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was going to get an autograph. <laughs> you mean to tell me that the TV has plastered Reagan's face all over the place for you to see and for you to experience his personality and the newspapers tell you everything about him and his wife and his kids and his ranch and everything else about him and none of you feel you have a personal relationship with President Reagan? Well, that's right. You can't have a personal relationship with Reagan because that which reveals the personal is impersonal. And so the Holy Spirit cannot be impersonal if he is to reveal he who is most intimate and personal. He must be a being. Okay? Second question, in relationship. Now, I've talked about this a little bit in the, in the first question, but here it is. How can that which is impersonal fully relate that which is personal to that which is personal? I'll repeat that. How can that which is impersonal fully relate, underline that word and punch it, relate, it's a good word, we need to experience it more in our lives, relate that which is personal to that which is personal, that which is personal is God, the being, that which is personal is you, another being, and yet we've got this impersonal something out there that's going to bring the two together, I don't understand, how can that happen? Third question is disclosure and reason. Why would he who is personal elect to try and reveal himself by that which is impersonal? I don't understand that. Why would he? Why doesn't he just relate himself to us? Why does he need something impersonal to relate himself who is personal? Why would he do it? Ask these little questions. These questions are good questions. Why? How? When? Where? Keep these words in your vocabulary. 
They'll keep everybody off of you. Believe me. And they'll drive everybody deep into themselves. Okay. In reality, his disclosure in reality. Now, here I got three questions. All right? Here it is. Can we ever learn to fully unite ourselves in love to a person whose power is all we can experience? Can we ever learn to fully unite ourselves in love to a person whose power is all we can experience? How many of you ever worked for, in, for a big, big company with a big president that was a corporate executive of that company? Occasionally he'd make a speech. Well, can you relate to him personally? You feel his power, his power that gives you your paycheck every day or every week. But are you personally related to him? No. You can't if all that you feel is his power. Second question under that. Why do we assume that in Christ, for three years of active ministry, God revealed himself personally in a being, and then for the rest of human time, impersonally. How's that possible? Why would God do that? In Jesus Christ, we're really revealing himself personally. And for three years of ministry, it was active dialogue with all the people that he came in touch with. And now suddenly he turns for the rest of human time and acts impersonally. Third question. In the context of the disciples' sorrow, as found in John, chapter 14, 15, and 16, remember when Jesus said, I am going away? And they were all distraught. What consolation would have the disciples had in knowing that he who was most intimate and personal was going to be replaced by that which was impersonal? What consolation? I'm going away and the Holy Spirit's coming. Oh, great. Now all we got to relate to is an impersonal power. You see the problem. And then finally, in reference, since the majority of references to spirit reflect a being whose essence is spiritual, angels, demons, man, his spirit, why then do we assume that when the spirit is used of God, it is not also indicative of a being as opposed to an impersonal power. You see, there's incongruency. There's something that these little details I just can't seem to understand, and maybe you can help. And that's the approach you take in trying to prove the identity of the Holy Spirit as a person. All right, quickly, let's move on then to the presence of the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit. Now here, I'd like to focus your attention on John chapter 16, verses 5 through 12. These are very important passages with respect to the work and presence of the Spirit of God. Since Christ, I'm going to make a quote here. Okay, now bear with me. Christ, since Christ is physically removed from our presence, the Spirit now engages the essential problem expressed through the flesh. That is, the weakened ability of man to spiritually perceive anything. He appropriates the presence of Christ to our spirit in the context of an inward spiritual dialogue. As our spiritual perception grows stronger as a result of this encounter, his followers begin to incarnate Christ afresh to the world. This is the revelation par excellence. For though the world denies his resurrection, they cannot deny the existence of his life expressed in the communio sanctorum, or the church. End of quote. You know who said it? 
Art Waitley said it. It's my quote. <laughs> Why not quote yourself? Well, it's quoting everybody else, right? Basically, what we're talking about here is this. We live today in a cycle of flesh in which our perception of everything rests with the five senses. We see things and we act accordingly. And you know most of us do this. First, every time something goes wrong, we try every physical thing possible until finally nothing works and so then we turn to God. Well, maybe he's got an answer. I tried everything I can. <laughs> We're in a cycle. We think physical. We feel physical. We act in physical ways. The data we receive is physical flesh. Now, when Jesus came to the scene, the substance of spirit, if you will, was fleshed into that cycle. He broke into that perception. He broke into that world in which we are locked into our five senses and revealed that which is spiritual into that which is the flesh. People say, well, I don't want Jesus to go away. I mean, if he goes away, then what do we have left? That's the point. He has to go away, says John 16. He has to. Why? Because the essence of the problem mankind faces is spiritual, not physical. It's because of the problem we have in the context of our own spiritual perception in that we are unable to perceive any data outside of the five senses. That Jesus himself, God himself, has to flesh that spirit that we could not perceive into the midst of the flesh so that now we, by the five senses, could perceive it. But that doesn't deal with the root of the problem. We see it. We're now motivated by it. But that does not deal with what's inside. So Jesus had to go away. Why? To remove the flesh from our perception so that he could replace himself with his same identical presence except this time the Holy Spirit who has the ability to move past the physical vessel as not a body blocking a union and into the heart of the individual so that we can begin to work that spiritual problem of perception out in our lives and the data of spirit can now be fed into our minds along with the data of the five senses and as a consequence we flesh Christ afresh in this century. Time does not border the incarnation. 2,000 years ago becomes today for the world that we live in. Now, John 16 tells us that this happens in three ways. And the first of which is found in verse 8 and 9. When he comes, when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Now this is the first step of fleshing Christ to ourselves, each other, and as a consequence, the world. Sin is not the deed. Now let's get that straight. Sin is not the deed. We have this focus in the church on everything that's being done. Don't you see? We're feeding our five senses rather than the spiritual root of the problem, which is sin. Sin goes to the heart. I quote Martin Luther. No matter how long one restrains, improves, and heals the outside, the stem, the root, and the source still remain on the inside. Above all, the source must be stopped up. And the root must be taken from the tree. Otherwise, you may stop up and restrain in one spot only to find the evil breaking and rushing out in ten others. The healing must be applied to the root. Otherwise, you can smear on salve and apply plasters forever. The separating and festering continue for all that and only grow worse. In brief, experience teaches and the world must acknowledge 
that it is impossible to restrain even the gross outward vices no matter how diligently one tries to check and punish them, as indeed should be done. Much less can the world remove the sin that inheres in the human nature and is really the basic sin but is unknown to the world. End of quote. Now, what then is sin? Sin is an imbalanced perception. We are caught in this cycle of only being able to experience things by these five senses. And so I see myself as a thing distinct from you. Now, how did this start? It started back in Eden with Adam and Eve. What did they do? Adam tried to become something he was not. Just like Lucifer. And what was it that Adam tried to become? Like God. But what did he do after he sinned? He hid behind the bushes. Yeah, he hid behind the bushes. Covered himself up. He was ashamed and naked. Is that a mark of oneness? Is that a mark of union? If you're in union with somebody, you're ashamed when you don't have any clothes on? No. Why? Because you're fully and completely at one. But when you're separated, there's a division. You see yourself as distinctly separate from another being. And there's this gap between the two. Now, all of your actions, all of your deeds, everything you do, rests on a hope of securing for yourself protection, security. You begin to worry because you're worried about yourself. And you, all of this comes from one word that results in separation or division. And that one word is fear. We are afraid of what someone distinct from ourselves can do to us and our well-being. But when we're in union, are we ever afraid? Now, we define death as what? Separation. And that's what happened in Eden. We were separated from God from each other, from ourselves. Now that's sin. That's sin. But in Christ, the world has been taken into the work of the cross. And as that has happened, the end of that separation, the end of that death, which we are now living in, as we reside in the limitations of our five senses, is brought to its end on the cross, non-being. But in Christ, the power and cycle of the Spirit, which is thoughts of oneness, feelings of oneness, deeds of oneness, reinforcing the thoughts of oneness, that cycle brings the cycle of the flesh into itself and at for a moment, brought to its end for three days, but yay, praise God, three days later, the cycle of the Spirit is victorious and Christ rises from the dead. That resurrection is the life of the world because now we can proclaim the fact that the end to which you go while you limit yourself to the five senses has been brought into Christ and a new beginning has taken over so that now we can live in the life of the Spirit, which is oneness. We are one as a result of Christ. Now, how do we get into that? You mean to tell me, Ark Wadling, that everybody in the world has been put into Christ? Yeah. Yeah. It's not a matter of receiving to get in. It's a matter of not receiving or you get out. You see, we've got this problem. The good news that we bring to somebody in the world is, hey, you've died. Your sins have been forgiven. And the end to which you have been moving has been brought into Christ 
And that end is done. It's dead. It's on the cross. It's crucified. But also, you've been resurrected in life. Well, sure, I ain't experienced any resurrection in life. That's because the Christ you've been put into has not been brought into you. But I got some good news. And here's the gospel. By inviting the Spirit of Christ, the presence of Christ, into your life, the reality of what I've just said can be experienced right now today. Right now, today. You mean there's nothing? Hey, it's already been done. But there's nothing I can do. It's already been done. There's nothing I can do to get it. No. It's done. But what do I do? Just sit there and receive it. The Spirit of Christ is right here, right now. And He wants you to receive it. Now what happens? When Christ's presence spiritually enters into that man's life, a dialogue begins to be set up. I call it the table of negotiation. Because that's in effect what it is. It's a seat of negotiation whereby... What you cling to the most is what God wants so that he can give it back to you filled with his presence. You see? And that's a dialogue that occurs constantly. But you see, something happens. Our perception changes. I no longer see myself as distinctly apart from you, whether you're my enemy or my friend, whether you're a Christian or not. But I see the Father in you because the Spirit of Christ is in me and He's unified to the Father and you're sustained by the Father. So as a result, I've got an intrinsic relationship to you. You know what that means? It means I have no fear. I don't fear you. There's no reason for me to fear you. Why? Because He who sustains you is He who sustains me and I'm at one with He who sustains you. Therefore, why should I fear you? You know what that elimination of fear can do to our relationships with people? I'll tell you what it means. It means we can love them and love them legitimately. I don't care about this stuff about people saying, you've got to love everybody because Christ loved everybody. Well, that's great. Christ loves them, so I've got to love them. Maybe I don't want to love them. What do you say to that? Maybe they're pretty unlovable. You see, there's no point of contact. But when you perceive the fact that, hey, you're at one with this person, you're one with him, not divided. Why? Because you're one with the God who sustains him. Unity. No fear. Now you say, I've got a touch point. I love God. God is in that person. There must be something about that person that I need to experience. And so I love. Now, that perception moves us past the superficiality of the flesh into the heart, the root, the spiritual nature of the man himself. We are enabled by the data we receive through spirit and flesh to now move deep into the heart of the person, into the root of the person. And if the person is out of fellowship with Christ, be he Christian or unsaved completely, we join ourselves to his root. And something happens. The same thing that happened in the first century when people were confronted with Christ happens today. Because when people were confronted with Christ in the first century, they were confronted with themselves. And they didn't like themselves. They saw what they could be, perhaps what they were, and the way in which they now are not. And some people hated him. And some people loved him. And some people were saved. And some people weren't. But either way, Christ joined himself to the heart and the root of the spiritual nature and problem of the man he confronted. And that's our task today. And he gives us that perception today by the Spirit. So that when we join ourselves to the root of the man, the root of the man is showing up for what it is. 
And our hope is also joined to His because we had the same root and still do have that same root. And the Holy Spirit is still working on that same root. As a result, the conviction of sin comes forth by virtue of the presence of the Spirit in us, flowing through us to the man, bringing us at one with the man, and forcing Christ before the man right now today. That's life. And that's the only way the Holy Spirit can convict a man of sin. He does it through you. The first mark of the presence of the Spirit in the 20th century today. I want to move on to the second presence of the Spirit, which is righteousness. Now, this is an important concept, people, because people... We have this thing in the church today that seems to indicate that what is most important is what we do. What is most important today in this life is what we do. Well, the problem with that is that righteousness has nothing whatsoever to do with what you do. You can't wake up one morning and say, Today, I think I'm going to be righteous. <laughs> Tomorrow, I may be unrighteous. But today, I will be righteous. No way. But we live that way. We live as if we do that. We say, Yesterday, I broke X number of laws of the church. So today, I'm going to try to live better. I'm not going to break the laws of the church. And you hold on and you grit your teeth and at the end of the day, oh, wow, praise God, I didn't break any of the laws of the church. You know? I was righteous today. No, that's not righteousness. Righteousness is the very nature and essence of God flowing out of you so that in the things that you do, the motive and the deed match. The motive and the deed match. If you're gritting your teeth trying to hold on to keeping the law, but inside you wish you could just break it, <laughs> then the motive and the deed don't match, you see. Now, if inside what you're saying is, well, I wish I could break it. I really wish I could keep God's law, but I want to break it. You know, it's this thing. I want to. So you don't break it because you're fearing God. What's he going to do to me if I do? <laughs> and what's worse, what's the church going to do to me if I do? You see. We live in fear. The gospel is in fear. The gospel is, hey, relax. God's done it. Yeah. So the method and nature of the Christian life is simply this. You don't do anything. Did he say what I thought he said? I don't do nothing. Right. You do no thing. God does it. He starts it, he works it out, he does it, and you're the vessel of expression, so you're completely and totally fulfilled because that's what we were created to be. Vessels of God's expression. And any time you try to express yourself and try to reach something that you cannot reach, you're living in fear. Your motive and your deed don't match. Now... Thayer defines righteousness as this, one who is such as he ought to be. See? You are created to be a vessel of God's expression. And incidentally, I suggest that all of us get on some type of a workout program and begin to become the vessels that God created in the first place. I have this old adage, some of us have temples that Satan himself wouldn't want to possess. <laughs> and it's true. Now, that doesn't mean you start to eat and get overweight so you can escape Satan. <laughs> yeah. 
But the whole point of it is this. When we talk about obedience, we are not talking about something that we do. We're talking about the one task Christian living has. There's only one thing you have to do. One thing in the Christian life that will allow you to participate in all of the promises that Christ made with respect to the abundant life. One thing. You know what it is? Let it go. I don't care what it is. It can be a physical object. It can be a symbol of a physical object. It can be a concept. It can be a theology. It can be a ministry. It can be a church. It can be a status. It can be anything. Let it go. That's what Christ said. And that's what holds us back. Because when we cling to it, what are we clinging to? That which we perceive with the five senses. We're out of balance. But when we're in balance, we let it go. Because it is not as important as the balance of spirit and flesh, in which it is God's. He is the common denominator. You are God's. You have God in you. And you rest in God, who is the common denominator of all things. You are the apex of God's creation. You express God in a unique way as not found in all the rest of creation. Therefore, your job is to do just that. Let it go and let God express himself through you. Now, what is the nature of God in man? Basically, it can boil down to three things. Love, light, and life. God is defined as those three things in Scripture. Love, light, and life. Right? A little louder. Thank you. That's right. He is defined as those three things. As a consequence... When the Spirit of Christ comes into our minds and the thoughts of Christ begin to enter into a dialogue with our minds, our perception of things begin to change and everything becomes a vessel of expressing God as opposed to what it used to be to hide God. And as a consequence of feeling and seeing God's expression, our feelings correlate to our thoughts and our perceptions and therefore our motives begin to accelerate so that the things we do are a direct result of the dialogue that ensues between the mind of Christ spiritually present by the Holy Ghost and our own thoughts and the limitations of our own perceptions. We become one with God. As a result, everything that we do reflects that oneness. Oneness is love. We therefore experience the first quality of God's nature in us. Love, union, I am unified with all of you. I don't care if you're my enemy or my friend. I am unified with all of you. If I see that, I will not fear and I will begin to move into the, the next dynamic which is able to pierce into your vessel and move into the real person you are. Your vessel doesn't make any difference to me except for what it's expressing. And when I see you express something, I no longer see you expressing something that is intrinsic to yourself. I see you expressing something that is intrinsic to one of two positions. Your harmony with God or your conflict with God. Either way, I see God. And either way, I can move past it and inside you. That's right. Because when we move, when we're able by this perception of union or love to move through a vessel into the very essential nature of the man, at that moment, at that point, we begin to reveal to the man something about himself. Why? Because God has revealed the same thing to us about ourselves. That's why Peter says, Sanctify the Lord God in thine heart and be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks the reason for the hope that lies within. But notice he prefaces the whole thing with sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. We got this thing we're ready to give an answer before God sanctified in our hearts. The problem is nobody's asked the question. And so we take on the nature of God's light as we move into creation by the Spirit through the vessel into the essential nature of the man himself. 
which then brings what? The third aspect of God, life. For as we move in light into the essential nature of the man, we also bring Christ with us, for he has accomplished that in us already, else we couldn't do it. And when we bring life to the man, he asks the question, and he gets an answer, the Spirit of Christ. And so he does the same thing we are training ourselves to do through the dialogue that incurs in our minds with the Spirit of Christ. That's this. Let it go. He's got to do the same thing we do. Perhaps a different level, but he still has to do it. Let it go. You see? And if we say, well, you have to do something, oh, and boy, do we pile the things we have to do onto each other, don't we? You want to become a Christian? God, do this, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Who wants to be a Christian? I sure don't. Not with all of that stuff. No, I want to know life. And then, with life, comes the motive by which my deeds will come forth. But that's between me and God, not you and the man you're talking to. Now, righteousness is that reflection of life. As we move into the individual, we bring the life of God into the individual. Somebody says, I know this friend that has just totally without hope. Totally without hope. What's your answer? Fine. Bring your hope to him. What are you going to do? Say, you can have this hope? Sure he can, but he's not ready to perceive that. Not until he joins with you in union and he begins to feel your hope. Man, we are so much in verbose dialogue with people, we forget about the nature of relationship that must underline the dialogue. And that's why we will convict the world of righteousness. Why? Because every single time we bring those qualities of God into the man. He recognizes that 2,000 years ago there was a man that stood in the same position and died for no reason of his own and was crucified erroneously. And he was righteous. The world rejected him. And he's no longer here physically. And that's all the world can see, is the physical presence. Christ is no longer here. But suddenly, we've got a contradiction. The same righteousness, the same life, the same being of God that was crucified and is proclaimed to be ascended 2,000 years ago, now today, comes to the man in the presence of you and the relationship between you and whoever it is you're talking to. But they rejected it. Christ is no longer here. So how can the righteousness be here? But the righteousness is here. Why? Because I'm experiencing something I've never experienced before in your presence. The righteousness of God. His love. His light. His life. There's a contradiction. I go away. The world seeth me no more. But they see you. How do I know? John 17, I in thee, and thou in me, that they might be one in us. Why? That the world may believe. And I tell you this, without unity in the body, you haven't got a testimony. Without union of yourself inside. You haven't got a testimony. And that brings us into the last function of the presence of the Spirit. Hang on. It's getting better. That's judgment. And judgment is a direct result of the other two. But let me tell you something. You can't have a judgment outside of the platform of power upon which the judgment rests. Somebody and say, you're doing the wrong thing. He looks at me and he says, well, who are you? What gives you the right to say that I'm doing something wrong? I saw this quite beautifully illustrated in The Scarlet and the Black, a movie that was on television last week. It was a magnificent movie in which a Gestapo agent went to a priest after slaughtering hundreds upon hundreds upon thousands, perhaps, of good people. And the priest was governed all of his life to fight that. And finally, the Allies were coming in, 
to the city. Hitler had lost. And this Gestapo agent comes to the priest and says, Can you get my family out? The priest goes, You must be kidding. You ask me to help you after you slaughtered all of my friends and all of my colleagues and all these good people of this city, and you ask me to help you? And he walks away in a furor. <laughs> well, he left the Gestapo agent at the end of his rope, standing there. And the man, I'll never forget the mother, it's, it's really... Uh, he said, there's, there's, at the end of his rope, there's no difference. He really was wondering, maybe there is a difference in what this priest is all about. But he said, there's no difference between you and me. There's no difference. What you preach, no difference. And then, after he was captured there in the prison, he finds out that his wife and children were led to safety. The Allies didn't know how, but he found out they were. And suddenly the light began to dawn. And the most magnificent thing is he was in prison for life by the Allies. And the only man that came to see him every single month, every single month, was that priest. His worst enemy, that priest. And you know what happened? I think it was something like nine years later, he was baptized into the Catholic faith. There's only one way judgment can take power. And that is if conviction of sin and righteousness flow as a platform upon which the judgment is based. But it's not spoken. You don't always have to speak the judgment in order to get your point across. we got to learn that, too. And who is judged? What in effect we are saying in our lifestyles of righteousness and our own conviction of sin dealing with our own root is this that when we operate in this frame of reference, the power of the God of this world is shown up to be incompetent, incomplete, in its manifestation of workability, in that what we face is a power that has been brought to its end and a victory that has been brought to its beginning. For God has judged the God of this world and the power of separateness which the world lives. And we have brought that truth to life as we have demonstrated in life oneness, union, love. Which brings me lastly to the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, very briefly, and I want to move through this fast because we are running out of time. The power of the Holy Spirit I see in three ways. And I focus in on John 16, 13 through 15, John 20, 19 through 22, cross to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and then Acts 2, 1 through 4. I'll read them for you. Don't even have to bother. Just kick back, relax, and get your... You've taken enough notes. Get your, get your focus of attention on this because we're running out of time. I know I don't want to belabor the point. But I really want to give you this because this is what we're talking about today, unity of the body. I'm telling you it's imperative that we have this or we don't have a witness. First, in our tranquility, our tranquility when the Spirit of Christ comes into our mind. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. John 20. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. In that chapter of John, the disciples were the most distraught they've ever been because their master had gone away. They had no power. They were in a severe depression. What happened? Jesus came into the room, said peace twice in the verses previously, and then said, Receive ye the Spirit. I most definitely believe the, 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 the disciples took them up on his offer. It was what I like to call the first part of their baptism, if you will, coming from a Baptist background. 
in which they received, and they received something when they received, and that was the fruit. The fruit. And what was it about the fruit that gave them their life so that when they got to Pentecost, power could be released? I'll tell you it was, first love, the perception of unity, then joy, the release from fear. We have nothing to fear now. Then peace, the fact that there's no situation that I can engage myself in, that I cannot see the Father, and because I'm at peace with the Father, I'm at peace with the situation or the man. Love, joy, peace, patience. <laughs> My time is God's time, and He's got all the time in the world and outside of it. And I tell you, this is a tough one for a lot of us, particularly on the California freeways. Patience. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I don't care what the situation is. Your time is not being wasted. We have a tendency to feel we're not going to be patient because our time's being wasted. Come on, hurry up. i got things to do. Don't you see where the perception lies? Self again. I've got things to do. Get out of the way. This is my road. <laughs> huh? But in effect, there is something to standing back and perceiving. When your mind is in tune with Christ, you begin to perceive Christ in the situation. You begin to perceive the Father holding the situation together, and as a result, you grow thereby. Your time is never wasted if you begin to see things the way God sees them. Because you're growing in every moment. I don't care if it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or 30 minutes on a bank line. Every one of those moments is an opportunity for you to experience the Father. Try looking around you at the faces of some of the people. See what you experience thinking the Father sustains that being. I tell you, it'll revolutionize your life. You will begin to grow in such a way that you've never grown before, and at least your hair won't turn as gray. <laughs> if I go any longer, I'm going to have to shave my beard off. Ten years younger in 30 seconds. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, that's the deed, goodness, that's the motive, gentleness, that is the ability to communicate both unobtrusively. I call gentleness the Columbo fruit because he comes on so gentle and yet he moves into you and conveys the goodness and the kindness, which is righteousness. Faithfulness. Hang in there! That's what it boils down to. What do I mean? When things are going tough, you know by your experience with the Holy Spirit today or yesterday or two weeks ago that something is better and it's worth holding on for. Just because you go down isn't the issue. Hey, we're all going down all the time, but the God gives us the strength to get back up again. That's the fruit of faithfulness. Self-control. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's the whole process of relationship, isn't it? Because as you begin to move in that area of self-control with respect to our relationships, what is further enhanced? Union. Love. The circle closes. The circle, people. That's the fruit. Now, in our tenacity is the second power of the Spirit. Verses 13 through 15 of John 16. And when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears. He will speak and he will disclose to you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Oh, that's beautiful words, people. Don't you know what it means? It means there's nothing in the universe that's not yours. Why? Because everything in the universe is God's. And wherever a thing keeps you down, well, that's just, just plain stupidity to let a thing keep you down. Not when you got all the thing plus everything else at your disposal. Why? Because it's the spirits. And he gives it to you and discloses it to you. We got this thing about Christians. We think, well, once they're baptized in the Holy Spirit and mutter a few tongues, we're okay. They're gone. That's okay. Let them send, send them forth. No problems. We've got it all. No, you don't. You're just beginning. <laughs> You're just beginning. Now you've got to confront all the things that you're used to confronting and see God in them. New revelation. All things become new. 
That's tenacity. You don't have it all at once, but you hang in there and you move deeper and deeper and deeper day by day. Now, from that point, we move into our therapy. And that's what I call the gifts, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. I love that. Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. They were filled. The whole house was filled where they were sitting there, appeared tongues of fire distributing themselves. They rested each one on each one of them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let me tell you something. These are the power tools. These are the power tools to accelerate the growth that you have experienced in the Holy Spirit by the fruit. And I'm going to make this statement. I don't care how many healings have taken place. I don't care how many of you speak in tongues. And I don't care how many miracles you see. If there's no unity in the body, if you don't have a oneness of the fruit of the Spirit flowing through people simultaneously and at once, those gifts don't mean anything. Why? Because I just as many healings as you want to quote from charismatic circles, I'll quote to you from Christian science circles. Just as many healings as you quote from charismatic circles, I can quote to you from Mormon circles. Jehovah's Witnesses speak in tongues. So what? And you want to talk about miracles? Hey, that's what the Antichrist is going to use to start proclaiming himself and helping the people of the world to believe in him. So please don't talk to me about physical manifestations of power unless that which underlines and undergirds that physical manifestation is also operable, which is the fruit. Now I'm going to prove it to you from a physical sense. And I recognize the limitations of that. But I need to try to make you understand how oneness is the most important thing with the release of power. There's only one way that I can do this, and we're going to need a volunteer. How much you weigh? 150? 150. How tall are you? 5'10". Five. Five uh, you look like you're in pretty good physical shape. Uh, why don't you get up for just a second, take your shoes off, don't take your socks off. <laughs> All right, I need somebody else, about the same weight. How tall are you? 5'11". Uh, 5'11", five five, about how much you weigh? 325. 325 is a little off. How about you? How much? Yeah, why don't you get up? Come on, take, take your shoes off and don't take your socks off. I need another person. Uh, look at this boy. Look at all these guys hiding. <laughs> look at them. Hey, Joe, I don't want them to take me. How much you weigh? 160. 160, about how tall are you? Uh, 6'1". Well, we'll take a shot. Come on. Shoes off. Now, brother, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I just want you to do for me one push-up on the floor. Just one. All right, thank you. Did you see that? Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. And we're going to have some. Uh, now, what I'd like you to do, okay, is the same thing, except I'd like you to do it without your feet touching the ground. Okay? And you can only use life. Can you do it? Can't do it. You need help. You think you could help him? Help him to do a push-up without his feet touching the ground? I could probably hold his feet, yeah. You could? Yeah. Could you hold his feet if I asked you to do a push-up at the same time he did one? No way. No way. Well, that's what I'm going to ask you to do. You can't do it? You need help. They need help. Can we get find some help? Maybe. You think you can help him? Okay. You think you can help them both do a push-up without their feet touching the ground? You will. Can you do a push-up at the same time that they're going to do it? <laughs> because that's what I'm going to ask you without your feet on the ground. <laughs> he is right. He is right. There's one element that's missing out of these three. That's me. Now I'm going to show you how it's done. All right? All right? I'd like you to just lay down there. Boy, I never thought I'd keep you guys out at 12 o'clock this time, but I think you're going to stay with me. <laughs> just lay right down. Straight. You know, no, this way. I'll take care of it. Okay, I want you to lay this way. Okay, all right, that way's fine. Now turn over. 
Okay? Come towards me a little bit, right here. You there? Now, for those of you on tape, or for those of you that are watching on tape, I'm putting one man down on the floor with his stomach to the ground. Okay? Come towards me. Bring your whole body towards me. That's it. Stay right there. Okay. Now, I'd like you to lay down right here with your feet across his back. Yeah, preferably more. Go ahead. Just lay right down on the floor. Just relax. Don't worry. I'm not going to hurt you. All right? So bring your feet right there. Okay? Move your body. Move that way. Okay? Now move forward a little bit. That's it. Okay. Now, what I want you to do... Right. Go right ahead. Isn't it funny? Art Waitling always does these crazy illustrations, isn't he? Just lay right down. Lay right down. No, no, just lay right down. Okay, no, just lay down. Okay, lay down. Lay down. Okay. Now. Yeah. Down. Okay. Down. Down. I'm down already. All right. Now wait a minute. All right. Boy, I tell you the things I don't do for the Holy Spirit, right? All right. Bring your feet across my back. Okay. Gentlemen, push up position when I say. Ready? Back straight. Easy. Leg straight. Up. Come on up. 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 All right. Down. Let's try it again. Up. Now, if I had had more time, I would have gone through halfway down, up, down, halfway down, up, down, etc., until somebody tired out. And then that corner would be down. So we bring a woman up and say, okay, grab his belt. When I say up, pull him up. Up. You see, the whole body is involved when we are talking about the release of power. But there must be a oneness that takes place first. There must be a unity in the body. And we have this thing that we can do it ourselves. We got this, all this power at our disposal. But you forget that that power is in each other, in the body. And if I am out of context with fellowship with those in the body, I cannot appropriate that power to the situation that I find myself. It is only as the Spirit of God moves to bring union through the fruit that the manifestation of His power will be released to be able to do things that we cannot do in and of ourselves. That's power. So you want to talk about the spiritual gifts, start talking about the spiritual gifts with respect to faith. Try talking to somebody you've never known. Take a leap of faith. Say, how are you doing today? That breaks the conversation in. Now, in knowledge, begin to perceive God and move through into Him in that gift of knowledge released inside of you. With the gift of wisdom, begin to appropriate the knowledge you perceive as God reveals to you the situation of this man. Then bring to Him the miracle of a unified life in that you've entered His world in a matter of minutes, and it's possible. And then if you want to heal somebody, talk about inward healing. You want to prophesy? Talk about moving God's world into His because you've joined yourself to Him in your relationship. You want to talk about discerning of spirits? Begin to sense what the problem is that this man is truly facing. Try communicating yourself to that man on a viable level so that he genuinely understands everything you are saying because you're relating to him as a human being. Those are what I call the existential gifts of the spirit. And as a result of that, you're going to see some powerful physical manifestations occur. But don't seek the physical manifestation. Seek the oneness first, the unity of the body first, and the rest will come to pass. This is existence in the being of God as Trinity. We can appropriate all that He offers us as we live in Him as Father, Word, Son, Holy Spirit. I pray that all of us will begin to see life in this way. It's blessed me. I pray that it will bless you as well.
Go in peace, all of you. God bless.